You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Debates concerning the Affordable Care Act of 2013 have at times resembled a dog and cat fight. But what about the care we give our four-legged members of the family? Are pet parents doing the best they can? Current research has shown that pet owners are increasing their expenditure on pet food and products, but are not investing in proactive wellness care for their pets. Why treats and not treatments? My guest is Dr. Sandra LeFave of Banfield Pet Hospital. She'll help to answer the question and reveal the results of the Banfield Pet Hospital 2013 State of Pet Health Report. We'll be right back after the short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Swipe It's a revolutionary new product that literally swipes away cat hair from virtually any surface. You know, most of us struggle with a roller or vacuum cleaner to clean up cat hair, but anyone who has tried either of these knows they just don't work very well. But Swipe It's patent pending glove has a magnetic-like quality that removes cat hair from almost everything. And best of all, Swipe It's is machine washable, so you can use it over and over again. To order, just visit SwipeIt's.com. That's S-W-I-P-E-T Yes, a simple solution for shedding. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Lafayette, thank you very much. Reading this report, it is amazing and very eye-opening. You're welcome. We also found it very eye-opening ourselves. We weren't expecting some of the findings that we did find. Well, you have an interesting background. You're a veterinarian, but also you have a PhD in epidemiology. For those people that are listening that may not know what's an epidemiologist and why would a veterinarian want to be one? Wow. Why would a veterinarian want to be one? Well, I wanted to be one because in being an epidemiologist, you can affect many pets as opposed to just the pets that you do see. Epidemiologists uh, examine patterns of disease and health in big groups of pets as opposed to just individual pets. So the research that we conduct can have a potential impact on thousands and thousands of pets as opposed to just the pets that you see in your hospital. So that's really interesting because oftentimes you think, you know, a MD, a doctor will take care of a particular patient, a veterinarian takes care of a particular cat, dog, bird. But would you say that MDs or veterinarians are more involved with population health or are they both equally involved? So epidemiologists are involved with population health for sure in that we try to decide, you know, are there certain risk factors that certain pets or people have that might predispose them to disease, whereas MDs and veterinarians are looking at individual pets when they come in and assessing them on an individual basis. Now, I found it interesting. You are part of a group known as BARC. And BARC is part of Banfield. What is BARC? BARC is our Banfield Applied Research and Knowledge Team. And we're actually a very special team. There's no other team like us in the world. And what we do is we use the data from the millions of pets that we see every year. And we use those data to answer questions that we think would be 
really important to understanding the health of the patients that we see and the health of patients everywhere. An example of that might be that we've recently conducted studies looking at risk factors for chronic kidney disease in cats. So identifying things in cats that might make them more susceptible to kidney disease. And in doing that, we hope to have the disease detected earlier so that cats can have a a better outcome once they are diagnosed with the disease. We also conduct um, research into how common diseases are, and that type of project, Morlac, is really important in veterinary medicine because at Banfield, we have the largest database in the world, and we can provide really important statistics on things that aren't known in the veterinary profession right now. We suspect a lot of things, but we don't know them for sure. So we can use the data from our millions of pets to just answer questions like, what diseases are most common? What diseases do we see less frequently? Where are they showing up? Are they changing in frequency over the years? These are the types of questions we answer. And there's no other institution in the United States or in the world dedicated solely to answering these questions. We're the only ones. There's no CDC for pets. (laughs) We're the only one who can answer these questions. It's really, uh, this is the type of thing that makes me want to come to work in the morning. It's really an honor to be able to work with these data. And that's what our team does. This is fascinating because as a veterinarian and seeing these clients that are coming in with their pets day after day, you get a feel for trends that you are seeing. Boy, you know, I'm seeing more obese pets. You know, is it just me and my practice in my particular part of the United States in Southern California or my colleagues in other parts of the United States seeing it? And then veterinarians will go to our conferences and there we're being educated by researchers, veterinarians, many times from the veterinary schools, universities, and they're seeing a different population because oftentimes these are the ones that are referred to them by the local veterinarian. But here you are with Banfield, you have clients that come in just for pet wellness, just like a regular everyday practice, but your numbers are huge. So I can see this really does make a difference. It's kind of like evidence-based medicine. That's exactly what we're aiming for. And as you mentioned, um, it's wonderful that other researchers are looking at data um, based on animals that go to veterinary teaching hospitals. Unfortunately, those animals are usually sick, whereas with Banfields, we get patients that are usually healthy and sometimes they're sick. So we get a better snapshot, if you will, of what's going on in the general pet population. We're really fortunate that way. And correct me if I'm wrong, this now is the third study that Banfield Pet Hospitals has put out looking at the state of pet health. Is that correct? That is correct. In 2011, we put out a report that looked at common diseases in pets. In 2012, it was the more chronic diseases. And then 2013, we looked specifically at lifespan and some things that might influence lifespan. What were the things that you found? What was like the number one thing that you found that will really affect a lifespan of a pet? I think a really important finding that we had was, and one that we can actually do something about, is that pets that are spayed or neutered live longer than their unspayed or neutered counterparts. So this is really important because it tells us that there is something we might be actually able to do to help our pets live longer. We also found that pets in certain states live longer than others, but that type of association is more complicated. There could be many things that contribute to that in those states, and I'm not going to recommend <laughs> that a dog in, say, you Mississippi move. <laughs> moves somewhere else because that's not going to change the situation. But... What I can say is that if a dog in Mississippi is unneutered, then it might be a good idea to get it neutered to offer it a better chance at living longer. So the lifespan association with spaying and neutering was something that was really important that we found, I think. And also, we also found that certain breed sizes live longer than others. 
and this is important for a couple of reasons. I think that PET, although it's generally known that, say, for example, a Great Dane dog has a short lifespan, in the past, this hasn't been based on evidence at all. It's just been based on kind of hearsay, and this is my experience with this breed of dog. Here, we've been actually able to demonstrate, based on data from millions and millions of dogs, what that lifespan expectancy can be. And it's important because if somebody's thinking about adopting or taking into their home a Great Dane, they need to know that it probably won't be around as long as, say, a toy breed. So you need to take that into consideration. And you also need to take into consideration the fact that because of their shorter lifespans, giant breed dogs are going to age faster than the smaller breed dogs. So they're going to develop the chronic diseases earlier. They're going to need to go see their veterinarians on a more frequent basis so that these chronic diseases can be picked up earlier than they are now. So there's all kinds of things that we think are really clinically important that we found out through this lifespan study. These are just a few things. Wow, so much to touch upon. Mm -hmm. Dr. LaFave, let's first start with, you mentioned spay and neuters. We'll start at a time when it's usually done as a puppy or a kitten. In your Mm -hmm. studies, have you found that there's an optimal age? Because I know that seems to be a major controversy now. We used to say, have it done for a cat or dog before their first estrocycle. cycle catching it early, decreasing the chances of breast cancer. But now some of the newer research seems to say that for certain breeds of dogs, larger ones, later might be better. What has your research found? So what our research found, it certainly is supportive in parts with what other people have found. Our particular research, we just published a study in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association in which we found a link between spaying and neutering at certain ages and the risk of becoming overweight later in life. And we actually found that it doesn't matter when during your life you are neutered, you still develop the same risk of becoming overweight. So for that particular outcome for obesity or becoming overweight, the timing of the spaying and neutering is not an issue. However, we are looking at other diseases and outcomes, if you will, to see if age at spaying and neutering does have an impact. We really feel responsible for doing these kinds of studies because, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these studies that you hear about where problems are found associated with spaying and neutering, these are done in dogs that go to teaching hospitals where pets are seen because they're sick in the first place. So we feel a responsibility to conduct similar studies using our general pet population of healthy and sick pets so that we can see if there's evidence to support the risks associated with early spaying or neutering or perhaps later spaying or neutering. I think there's a lot of factors that come into play and because of our large data sets, we're able to control for a lot of things that might influence I think the jury's still ultimately out on this. I know that the Morris Animal Foundation is doing a long-term study with golden retrievers and just getting golden retrievers throughout the United States and following them and neutering and cancer and longevity. You mentioned that neutering a pet, yes, there's an increased chance of obesity. Metabolism slows down. As they're getting older, they slow down. So obesity, yes is a real problem. And looking at your data from your State of Pet Health 2013 report, it looks as though obesity is a real concern for cats and dogs. How common did you find it to be? It's approximately one in every five cats and dogs. And this is just what has been documented. So it's possible it's a little higher. In my experience in the hospitals, I see it a lot more But this is based on what has been recorded in the actual medical records. So I I suspect it's kind of an understatement and that there are actually more fat pets out there, (laughs) unfortunately. And the sad part is, really, it is unfortunate because so many clients come in and I'll say, "Um, 
by the way, you kind of have a chunky monkey there because you never want to call them fat or obese because it hurts the owner's soul more than the pet. Oftentimes they'll say, oh, I go to the dog park and there's other dogs that are a lot fatter than mine or I have a cat at home, another cat, and that cat's a lot bigger than this one. So this cat's not fat or this dog's not fat. And my usual retort is, well, if you want to look skinny, have fat friends. And we've gotten so used to <laughs> seeing fat dogs and fat people and cats that I think we've become a little desensitized and we don't know how to recognize it. How would you recommend that a client assesses a body condition score? So at Banfield, we have a very um, standardized test for that, and that is to put your hands on the pet and, you know, just on either side. And if you can feel the ribs, and but not too prominently, then that generally means that the pet's at an ideal body weight. But if you're starting to have problems feeling the ribs, that and you look at the pet's profile and you start to see the stomach protruding, and that's a better way of determining, you know, I think it's a little overweight. Some pets are obviously overweight. It's I find, like you say, it's the ones that are kind of in between. The, in my opinion, the best way, though, is to put your hands on the pet, see if you can feel the ribs. If there's some fat in between the ribs and where you're feeling, that's probably a good indication that your pet could stand to lose some weight. And there are guidelines for these kinds of things that are available on the Internet that could help pet owners. It's so hard, though, because what do you do when a pet owner is overweight, too? It's a really difficult conversation to have. And I think and overweight and obesity in, in the human population is the same situation where people are like, well, there's people fatter than I am. So I totally understand the situation. It's a difficult and conversation. conversation. You're definitely right, Dr. Lefebvre. And sometimes I'll find I may have an obese owner and I'll just concentrate on the pet. And I like you're not even there. Just listen. And so many times I've had clients who said, you know, my pet has slimmed down. And, you know, I have also. I feel so much better. My pet feels better. So a veterinarian can really affect the health of the entire family. And, and it's really very rewarding when things like that happen because I know that I'm improving that life quality and quantity for a pet and maybe for the pet owner too. Speaking of quantity, in your studies, neutering a pet, how much longer typically will a pet live if it's been neutered versus its unneutered counterpart? Okay, so for spayed cats, they typically live 13.1 years, whereas mm -hmm. unspayed cats, live 39% less. So let's see, nine and a half years, which is considerably shorter. That um, is an amazing amount of time. It really is. And neuter cats, a neutered male cat, live an average of 11.8 years, which is 62% longer than a neutered male cat. And similar findings for dogs. You know what's really interesting, though, is that we did a little research of our own to supplement the state of health report, and we found that neutered dogs and cats are more likely to be hit by cars. And that could be one of the many things that contributes to this is that they're out roaming. You know, it's, they take riskier behaviors. It's hard being an unneutered pet because you have these biological urges. You're probably more likely to be outside because it's hard to have <laughs> an unneutered <laughs> pet in the house. They, um, they're they looking for love, yes. They're roaming the neighborhood for looking for love. love. Yes, and they're marking up your furniture and it's easier to have them outside. So they're exposed to all different kinds of risks than I would say that the spayed and, and neutered pets are. Did that answer? Well, I'm talking right now. Yes, it did answer my question. I know there's a lot more answers that you have. I'm talking right now to Dr. Sandy Lefebvre. She is with Banfield Pet Hospitals. And we're talking about the State of Pet Health Report for 2013. We're going to be right back after the short break. We'll have some more very revealing answers to questions you might not have known that you even had. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly right after these messages. Dyson. 
The new Dyson Animal Vacs are powerful bagless upright vacuums for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Vac, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Vac today. Dyson, music to your ears. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to audibledeals.com. That's audibledeals.com. This year, Americans are expected to spend a jaw-dropping $36 billion on their pets. From lighted leashes to high-end spa products, the discriminating pet owner can find just about anything to pamper his or her pet. Hi, this is Michelle Fern. Join me every week for Best Bets for Pets, where we'll talk about the latest pet products and talk to the companies that make them. Best Bets for Pets, every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Lafayette, at the beginning of our conversation, you made mention a couple times about living in Mississippi if you're a dog or a cat, and you were looking in this pet health report, state of health report for 2013 looking at the various states in the United States. Some pets live longer in some and less in another. What states are the healthiest for a dog or cat to live in? Okay, so the states with the longest lifespan for cats would be Montana, Colorado, Rhode Island, Illinois, and Nebraska. And for dogs would be South Dakota, Montana, Oregon, New Mexico, and Colorado. So being in Montana is good for your health. That's where my daughter lives, and it's a nice area. We like it. Now, where is that might not be to your longevity's liking? Okay, so we're talking some of the southern states, unfortunately, and I don't want to malign them because they um, there's some wonderful parts about the southern states. But when you think about Mississippi and uh, Louisiana, they had some of the shortest life, the shortest lifespans, and they also had the uh, highest proportion of unneutered dogs, so unspayed and unneutered dogs. Mississippi had 44% unneutered dogs and Louisiana, 38%. So we've already identified that um, not being spayed or neutered can shorten your lifespan. These two particular states, too, also have a huge problem with heartworm infection, which is really, really sad. Because that's a totally preventable disease. It is a totally preventable disease, and it's also treatable, Unfortunately, it's expensive to treat and some owners are not, cannot afford the treatment or they don't want to put their dogs through that treatment. So we can prevent it easily and we can also treat it. For cats and dogs too. Exactly. So in um, Mississippi, for example, 7% of dogs were diagnosed with heartworm infection in 2012, which is a huge number when you think about it. That's one in every 14 dogs, Um, and that's a shame. And it's understandable because, you know, with the hurricane and all that stuff going on, dogs just didn't get the the protection that they needed. And also in Louisiana, 5% of dogs um, had heartworm infections in 2012. So I suspect that these are huge contributors to the shorter lifespan. And again, it's totally preventable. What are some other states that have 
shorten lifespans for their cats and dogs. So some other states would be Delaware for cats. Uh, for cats, it would be Delaware, Ohio, and Kentucky. And then for dogs, it would be Alabama, Delaware, and Massachusetts. But you hmm. want to know something interesting is that although Massachusetts was one of the worst states for lifespan in that it was had one of the top five states with the shortest lifespan for dogs, it actually had one of the longest lifespans for cats. So that's... An Any idea why? Well, it just suggests to me that there's a lot more going on in this than we're, we're capturing by just saying living in these states. Diseases are multifactorial. Um, influences on lifespan are never, it's never one thing. And if you fix that one thing, you're set for life. Um, there's always many things going on. So I don't know. That particular state would be really interesting to investigate. You know, why is this? It's like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. But there might be some obvious answers if we delve deeper into the data. Huh. When you're looking at these various states, the ones with the best longevity, the shortest lifespan, and yes, it'll be all over the board as to, you know, they may have a a 22-year-old cat that lives in Mississippi and has just been one that's evaded disease and has been extremely fortunate, proper genetics, veterinary care. But in general, when you're looking at longevity, what are some of the common diseases that you found that can shorten a pet's lifespan? So chronic kidney disease is a big one for cats. I'd say diabetes, hyperthyroidism, cancers. Cancers are big. We uh, don't have much data on cancers in our pet population, but we suspect that that's a huge one. Dental disease seems to be fairly common too, and I know that can affect a pet's longevity. Oftentimes people say, oh, it's just bad teeth, or they just look at the teeth up in front and it's like, no, 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 let me show you and pull back the lip, flip the lip, show them the molars, the teeth towards the back. And it's like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that was going on there. Dr. Lefay, talk to us a little bit about dental disease. I think that's very important. It's hugely important, and that's one of our, we have um, pillars of preventive care that we highly promote. Dental care is so important. We're not sure at this point in our understanding of dental disease whether um, dental disease co-develops with other serious diseases. For example, it's been associated with kidney disease and heart disease. And we're not sure at this point if it's just pets as pets age. They also are more susceptible to periodontal disease. I suspect periodontal disease is a general reflection of how well the pets are taken care of so that if a pet is allowed to develop this horrible, and periodontal disease can be painful with the later stages. So if a pet is allowed to develop that, then um, owners possibly are going to miss other things that the pet could also get. So we're not sure that periodontal disease causes these other more severe diseases or if not more severe than more just dramatic diseases. But there is a definite correlation that we've shown over and over again. We've actually shown in two prior studies that as the stage of periodontal disease increases, the risk of having heart disease or kidney disease goes up in dogs. And we're currently investigating whether that's true in cats as well. Periodontal disease, oftentimes people, that's a term people aren't familiar with, going, oh, dental tartar and and calculus, but what's periodontal disease? And that's actually a disease of the ligaments, the tissues holding that tooth into the jaw, into that gum line. And I'll tell clients that when that becomes compromised, that bacteria that's supposed to go from their mouth to their bum, stay in the GI tract can actually get into the bloodstream and yes, studies have shown, goes to the liver, the kidneys, the joint and the heart muscle and you're right, we'll never be able to say, did it cause that kidney disease, but it probably didn't help it. It probably didn't help it and it does compromise their health and their um, ability to fend off other diseases. 
So, yeah, it, to me, it's a reflection of the general care of a pet. And I really wish that people would bring their pets in more often for dental cleaning. There's no evidence that cleaning pets' teeth in this state will put them right back on the track to health. I suspect though, that it might. And we're actually conducting a study right now where we're investigating whether that is true. Ultimately, their pets are in pain when they have periodontal disease. You know, the the roots of the teeth are exposed. It can be very comfortable for a pet and it's just making them miserable. So yeah, I really wish that pet owners appreciated this your dog has bad breath. It's not funny. There's probably something going on in there. And I think it's going to take a lot more effort on veterinary medicine's part, organized veterinary medicine, to help pet owners appreciate that because we haven't done a very good job at it in the past. We haven't. And there's a lot of research yeah, going on right now with anesthetic dentistries versus non-anesthetic who should do it? We know, number one, it should not be done at your pet store. It should not be done at a groomer. However it's done, it needs to be done under the supervision of a veterinarian because it is a medical procedure. Getting those teeth clean before they need the root canal, before they need the extraction is so important. It'll be less money also for the pet owner. And that's always, you know, of paramount importance. At the bottom line, bringing your pet in frequently, catching these problems before they're catastrophic. It's going to be easier to treat, less expensive to treat, and typically have a better outcome. All those things you want for your pet so it can live longer no matter what state you live in. Well, and absolutely. I totally agree with you. And remembering again that lifespan of dogs and cats is shorter. They age faster. So if you decide even to take your pet into uh, for a, a dental examination once every three years, that's like you going into the dentist once every 20 years. It's not enough. So routine care, trying to catch it before it becomes a huge problem is so important. And I just hope pet owners at some point come to appreciate that. We appreciate it for ourselves. So I'm hoping that we will someday appreciate it for our pets. We're their advocates. So yes, we, we are definitely their need advocates. you. So Dr. Mm-hmm. LeFay, what can pet owners do to ensure that their pets live as long as possible? Well, I think it all comes back to preventive care. So setting them up for the best possible chance of a long life would include things like getting them vaccinations and keeping those regular so that if they are exposed to infectious diseases, they won't be affected giving them parasite control regularly so that if they are exposed to parasites, who cares because they're not going to catch them. Setting them up with proper nutrition so that they're getting the nutrients they need in the appropriate amounts and keeping an eye on their body weight um, to make sure that they're not eating too much or that they're getting enough. Another thing, uh, we've talked about dental care, which I think is really important. Some things that people tend to forget are behavioral issues. And this is a thing that can interfere with a pet's lifespan and that pet owners may not dedicate as much time as they should to ensuring that the pet is happy and if there are problems that arise, such as urination outside of the litter box or scratching up at furniture, that they get help in dealing with that through talking with their veterinarian. And I really think that these kinds of things can ultimately lead to, unfortunately, euthanasia because pet owners just can't deal with it anymore. But if you get veterinary help in there early, you're able to stave off some of these things. Even, you know, with uh, spaying and neutering, keeping, keeping your pets indoors as opposed to outdoors, all of these things. Um, getting routine blood work is also important because Pets cannot talk to you, and cats in particular are notorious for hiding signs of illness. So their blood work can talk after the point where everyone believes that puppies and kittens should get vaccinated and dewormed. But after the puppy and kitten stage, people tend to forget that as a pet ages, and as we've learned, pets age really quickly, They need to keep coming back, have that blood work done, and have their clinical signs assessed by veterinarians so we can catch the things that might be going on that aren't obvious to the pet owners. 
all of these things I think could help them live longer because the sooner you catch something, the easier it is to treat. Dr. Lafay, you are so right. I mean, subtle can be significant. Get that pet in at least yearly for a good wellness exam. Look for trends on blood work, and hopefully that pet will live with you for a long, long, good quality of life. Dr. Samuel Lafay, Banfield Pet Hospital. We do, we do want that. There are kids. Thank you so much for being with us today. You've given us some great information. My total pleasure. Thank you for asking. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Thank you very much for listening. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Thanks for listening. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.